to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we just thank you for your presence in your house tonight. Lord, how good it is to come into your house, experience your presence, and have an encounter with the living God. Lord, we pray that tonight as we open up your word, God, that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. May we have hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our lives. God, we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color, God. We came to hear from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction that we need for our individual lives. And Lord, we thank you that you can speak a now word to every person in this room. How wise and how awesome you are, God. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we ask it for our brothers and sisters all over the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, God, there are brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. We see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, God. So we bless all of our Baptists and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostal, Calvary Chapel, Harvest, God. Thank you for Oak Valley and uh, the Well, the Way, Ecclesia for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God. Bless all of our four square denominational brothers, God. We thank you, Father God, for the assemblies of God. Lord, we thank you for our Adventist and Catholic brothers, Lord, and our sisters in the Lord, God. We thank you, Father God, and we bless them this night as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say amen. 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 Well, get your Bible out tonight and go with me to the book of John. We're going to be in John chapter number 14 to start out. John chapter number 14. Tonight, the title of the message is Getting to the Greater Works. Getting to the greater works. What do I mean by that? Well, in a society where fame and fortune are exalted, as Christians, we tend to shy away or not really look to anything that could be called ambition or aspiration or even desire for anything greater. And we take a look at it as worldly and wrong. And yet, when I read the scriptures, I don't see God being ashamed of blessing his people, of doing great and mighty wonderful things. I don't see God ashamed of people prospering or doing great works. In fact, I see quite the opposite. I see in the godly people that the Lord points out to us in the scriptures that they had a desire on the inside of them for something greater than themselves. That they weren't content to just sit by and let life pass them by. That that they wouldn't allow things just to remain the same. That stuff actually bothered them. And that they really wanted to see the Lord move and the Lord do great things. Anybody that gets a hold of God, as you see them in the Bible, they may start out, maybe they weren't wise, maybe they weren't influential, maybe they didn't have much, maybe they weren't strong, maybe they weren't smart or any of that kind of other stuff. Maybe they weren't born into a king's family or something like that. Some of them were. But really what you see is people that their heart, as they get in proximity to the Lord, in other words, as they get closer to the Lord, as they know more about the Lord, all of a sudden their life starts to change and and, and great things start to take place. Jesus spoke about these things in John chapter 14. We're going to take a look at verse number 12 through verse number 16. John chapter 14, starting in verse number 12, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He tells them many things, starts talking to them, starts telling them really that he is God in the flesh. Starts telling them that if you want to see the Father, you've already seen him because you've been with me. And and as they start to talk about these things, he says, don't just believe me, believe me, but believe the works that I do. And as well, he goes on in John chapter 14, Verse number 12, and he says these words. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Now, hold on a second. What did Jesus do while he was here on the earth? Well, he healed the sick, cleansed the leper. He preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. He overcame temptation. I mean, think about it. What did Jesus do while he was here on the earth? He had crowds of people that he would declare and proclaim the word of God to, and he had individuals that he would declare and proclaim the word of God to. What else did Jesus do while he was here on the earth? Well, his ministry was so powerful at times that the Bible records that all who came to him were healed or delivered. He cast out demons with the word. He, he would hear what the Father would speak, and he would give unusual directions, and unusual things took place. In fact, people marveled at the things that Jesus did, supernatural things. He spoke to storms, and they calmed. He would walk on water. He raised the dead while he was here on the earth. And now here, Jesus gives a promise to us in his word 
John chapter 14, verse number 12, most assuredly, in other words, this is a truth. This is something that I want you to understand and know that this is real. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Church, we need to get to the greater works. We need to get to the works of Jesus. We need to be the hands and feet of Jesus on the earth today because the Bible tells us that we are the body of Christ. Therefore, we are the living, moving, breathing organism of God here on the earth. We are the mouthpiece. We are the heartbeat. We are the hands. We are the feet. And therefore, the works that Jesus did, we need to see evident and real in the church. Now, it may not look like what we think it should look like. It might be hidden, but it may be no less real. Take a look at what he goes on to say. He says, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works. Everybody say greater works. Greater. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. Jesus is saying, if I go to the Father, and I'll show you this from Scripture in a moment, he says that it's not just going to be one Jesus on the earth, it's going to be millions, if not billions, of Christians on the planet, filled with the power of God, God in the flesh, right? Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory, power of the Holy Spirit moving on the earth, and not just one vessel, but now Many vessels. And that's where the greater works come from. Let's take a look at it. It says, look at this, verse 13. And whatever, everybody say whatever. whatever. Whatever you ask in my name, in my name meaning in my authority, in my power, right? Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Now that's quite a promise from God. Because do you know what whatever means in the Bible? It means whatever. It's exactly right. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. In other words, when people see the greater works, when they see the unusual things taking place, when they see the supernatural, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the gifts of the Holy Spirit taking place in the church, they look at that and they say, that man or that woman couldn't do that on their own. There has to be something more going on. There has to be something more taking place. Or if they mistake it for you, the fact that you are praying in Jesus' name now directs their attention to the fact that you've got something they don't got that you got a power, that you have an authority, that you have something that you are working and operating in now, and they see that, and they say, well, that must be connected with Jesus, and Jesus connects them to the Father. Are you listening tonight? Verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Is God forgetting what he just said? Or is he repeating it for our sake? He wants us to get a hold of this. He wants us to understand this. He wants us to know this. And he's repeating himself for emphasis. He's telling us something. He wants us to get a hold of this, that we need to operate in these greater works. And if we're not, then it's time to ask. It's time to believe God. It's time to start to look for the opportunity. It's time to ask. Verse 15. Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now hold on a second. Did he just switch thoughts? Or is this still in the same vein of thinking? See, we have chapter and verse, and maybe you've got one of those Bibles that has the titles over the different things, and now there's a, a new section coming up. But Jesus was speaking, and Jesus had one connected thought here. So he says, if you love me, keep my commands. So we need to take a look in the Word of God and say, well, what does Jesus command? Jesus commands us to go. Jesus commands us to do. Jesus commands us to live a holy life. Jesus commands us to be filled with the Spirit. Jesus commands us to do many things. There's many things that Jesus commands in the Word. Now you've got to get into the Word to know what His commands are. And the Bible says His commands are not a burden, and He adds no sorrow to it. And therefore, we need to operate in the commandments of God if we really love Him. See, a lot of people loving God don't do what He says, ask in His name, and don't get what they want, and then wonder, what's going on, God? Where are you? Are you real? Hmm. Verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper. Everybody say another helper that he may abide with you forever. See, the Holy Spirit is now that helper that comes to us. Holy Spirit is the one that comes in the likeness of Jesus. He is a, another helper. He comes alongside us in the same fashion Jesus was, but now it's not just one Jesus, like I mentioned. It's the Holy Spirit in all of the believers. Now, Jesus has shed his love abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit. And now if you are baptized or submerged in the power of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. 
in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. That means that you have influence in your hometown, in your county, in your state, in your nation, and all over the world. We've seen that happen with people who just believed God, who obeyed his commands, who prayed, and things happened. God is looking for us as a people to desire and to want to go after and to get to the greater works. I believe that if we can live a life here in John chapter number 14, if we live in light of what we read and not just read it and then move on, no, we've got to meditate on these things. We've got to get these things incorporated into our life. We have to bring them up again and again. We have to go back to them from time to time. See, we've read these scriptures and we understand these scriptures, and yet just the fact that we can say, I understand it, doesn't mean that we always operate in it. God wants us to get to the greater works. He doesn't want a weak church. He doesn't want a church that's shrinking back. No, he wants a church that's moving forward, that's pushing back the darkness, that's gaining ground, that's shining light, that's being salt here on the earth. God wants a potent, powerful church. See, when church operates the way Jesus operates, things happen. Not only do things happen, but people get mad. Just like we talked about this morning, there will be persecutions. People are going to hate you just because you're a Christian, just because you're moving and shaking. I, I love reading the book of Acts because Acts shows us kind of a picture of what the church should be. Now, definitely, culturally, there's some differences, but when you take a look at what's going on, you say, man, that, that should be the report. That should be the testimony. That should be what's going on. And here in the book of Acts, we find that the church was so influential when people were witnessing and crowds would show up that people got envious. People got mad. The haters showed up. They started gossiping. They posted on Twitter and Facebook all this madness about them, right? And, and, well, maybe not in the book of Acts, but now they do today. But see, if the church is doing what the church should do, there should be some moving, there should be some shaking, there should be some people that are uncomfortable. There should be some talk going on. Tonight I want to take a look at a, an Old Testament example. See, the Bible tells us that everything in the Old Testament was kept as examples for us. Now, I've been reading about this guy by the name of Gideon. If you want to turn to Judges, the book of Judges in the Old Testament. Judges, chapter number 6. Talking about getting to the greater works. I see a passion and I see a desire in this man, Gideon, that I believe as Christians we can learn from his example. Judges, chapter number Six. We're going to start in verse number 11. Starting out, we'll read through verse number 16. We'll pull out some principles as we go. Judges chapter 6, verse number 11. The Bible tells us that Midian is oppressing Israel. Anytime they have crops, the bands of raiders come through and they steal all the crops. They wouldn't let them have any weapons. The Israelites are hiding in caves and strongholds in different places. They're afraid to do anything. Because if they have anything, the enemy is going to come and destroy and take away. Now, Israel was worshiping idols at the time. And therefore, the Lord had abandoned them and had removed his hand of protection from them and his blessing from them. They cry out to the Lord. God sends a prophet to them. He tells them that uh, basically it's a rebuke, telling them, look, you guys started to worship other gods. And, and so therefore, their hearts start to turn. And now we pick up the story in Judges chapter number 6, verse number 11. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. Right away we can notice something, that wheat does not belong in a winepress. Is that right? What do you do in a winepress? Press wine, right? So Gideon should be in there with the grapes, doing the Italian dance, you know, with the skirt up or something like that. But he's not doing that. What's he doing? He's threshing wheat in the wine press. Why? Because if the raiders knew that Gideon had wheat, they would take it from him. So you can imagine this man in this wine press, right, with wheat, bending down, throwing it up into the air, and hoping that the wind is going to carry away the chaff so that the wheat comes down. That's the picture that we start out with of this man Gideon. Verse number 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Now this is a guy that's hiding in the wine press. And yet, this is the guy that's threshing wheat, on the other hand. See, all of us could say, you know, we're fearful in certain places. But when you start to step out and you start to do something, the Lord takes a look at the heart. The Lord sees where you're at in life. And even though he may have been in a wine press, God still saw past that and saw this guy's threshing wheat. 
This guy's doing something. This guy's moving. He's not afraid to go out and take a chance. And therefore, he calls him out and he says, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Verse 13, Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles? Which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now I'm going to pull out something because this is an amazing statement that Gideon just made. Basically, he says, You're calling me a mighty man of valor, telling me that the Lord is with me, and yet I don't see the miracles. I've heard about them. Our fathers told us that the Lord delivered us from Egypt, and yet now we're worshiping other gods, and I don't see the miracles. I don't see the deliverance. We're under the oppression of Midian right now. Where are all his miracles? Can we go back to part A of that verse? If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles? See, he says, where's the greater works? There was a desire on the inside of Gideon. I believe that Gideon believed the stories that he heard were true. I believe that Gideon had faith and understood that the Lord was able to do greater things. And yet I also believe that Gideon had a discontent on the inside of him as he was there threshing wheat in a wine press. No one wants to do that. No one wants to hide. No one wants to be afraid. No one wants to be oppressed. And yet here's a man threshing wheat in a wine press, and he says, where's the miracles? Where's this God that delivers? I've heard the stories. Now again, we would think that the Lord would rebuke him. Why are you being so fearful? Why are you so afraid? And yet the Lord deals with him right where he's at. Take a look at it. Next verse, verse number 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours. We wouldn't have said that. That's might. We would have said, You're scared. And you're hiding. You need to get brave. You need to go take lessons. You need to get a revelation or something like that. And yet the angel looks at him, and he looks past the surface, looks past the place that he's in right then, and he looks to the heart, and he sees there was a desire for the miraculous on the inside of him, and he says, go in this might of yours, right here, believing God for greater things. Go in this might of yours. You shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Gideon, are we really back to this? I mean, it seems like two different conversations are happening, and yet the Lord put them both together. He says, How can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you. You shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Now I want you to notice that his comments were not condemned or ignored by the Lord. God wasn't just ignoring Gideon's statement. He was actually answering Gideon's statements. And again, he was dealing with Gideon where he was at in life. I, I, this is just me. When I take a look at the miracles that took place in Gideon's life, the miracle started with some signs to Gideon to strengthen his faith, to get him to a place where he could go and carry out the plan and purposes of God. Now, that does not give us permission to go lay out a fleece before the Lord. Are you listening? Because sometimes we say, okay, God, if you want me to go to church tonight, I want every light to be green all the way to church, and then I will know, and I will not turn right and go on the freeway and go home. I will turn left and go to the rock, you know? And, and that's how we think that the Lord's going to speak to us. And yet God is not playing games. God has given us his commandments and his word. God expects us to be strong in faith now. We're in a different dispensation than Gideon was in. Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. The Holy Spirit had not yet been given. And the word and the counsel of God was not in this form as we have it today sitting on our lap. God expects a whole lot more of us as the church than he did of Gideon there in the wine press. And God saw where Gideon's heart was at, and therefore he didn't rebuke him. He dealt tenderly with him, and he strengthened him, giving him the word of the Lord. What did he say? He said, I'll be with you, Gideon. You believe in a God that could deliver the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. You've heard of the miracles, and now that same God is going to go with you, Gideon. That same God is going to be on your side. That same God will deliver you because Midian is not your problem. Your problem is idol worship. And if you take care of the right things, I'll take care of the problems. Are you listening tonight? Gideon's comment was accepted 
I believe, for a couple reasons. Because, number one, it came from a heart that feared the Lord. He genuinely feared the Lord. Supported the plan of God. God had a plan and a purpose on the earth that he needed to get done. And Gideon's requests... Lord, show me a sign. Consume the sacrifice. There, the uh, miraculous things happen. I wish we had time to go through everything that happened to Gideon. Gideon brings him a sacrifice, places on the rock, and and the angel consumes the sacrifice. Gideon realizes, I just spoke to the Lord face to face, and I'm going to die. And the Lord says, no, you're not going to die. And he says, the Lord is peace. He gets a revelation from God of one of the names of God. Jehovah Shalom. And also... Gideon's comments were accepted because it strengthened the faith of the believer. In other words, Gideon was at a certain level of faith, and as he started to ask these questions, and he started to bring the reality of where he was at to God, his desires, his fears, his position in life, I'm the weakest, I'm the least, right? That was a true heart of humility. That was a true heart that said, God, what can I do? I'm sitting here in the wine press, and yet you're calling me mighty man? See, if we can get real with God and take off all of the, the, what is it, fake hates, right? facades, whatever you want to call it, the masks, the different things that we put up to make ourselves appear as something and yet say, God, you know me anyways. Let's get real, God. Let's get raw. God, I want to strengthen my faith. So you start to get into the word of the Lord and you find out God says, I will be with you. Jesus says, ask me anything and I'll give it to you that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I'll give you another helper. See, as you get a hold of the word of the Lord, you start to get strengthened and you start to see the greater works. Why? Because you can believe God on a greater level. Now, there's a couple of things that happen in Gideon's life and we're going to go through these things, uh, just a, a couple of verses Pull them here and there. If you have some time during the week, I would encourage you, read the whole story because it'll bless you. But if we want to see greater things, we must do some things in our life. And we see them in John chapter 14, but we also see them in the life of Gideon. And tonight, I want to go through them quickly and and take a look at them. If we're going to see greater things, we must do some things. Number one, if we're going to see greater things, we must greatly fear the Lord. If we're going to see greater things, we must greatly fear the Lord the Lord. We cannot have the best of this world and the best of God all at the same time. We must choose God or the world. Can't ride the fence because you're just going to get hurt doing that. You burn the candle at both ends, eventually you're going to be burnt out. God is a jealous God, and he desires not half, not three quarters, not 99.9% of you. God wants 100% of you. God wants it all, or he wants nothing. That's why Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot or cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you out. What does that mean? In or out, but you can't just stand there with the door open, hoping that, you know, you can play both sides, you know? Not going to happen. God says, either you're for me or you're against me. Get on board. You've got to greatly fear the Lord. What does that mean? That means that we have to get stuff out of our lives that is ungodly. Let me say that again. We have to get stuff out of our lives that's ungodly. Now, this is not a popular statement, especially in America where we so want to be comforted and we so want what we want and we want it the way that we want it. And yet God says, no, my way. And we say, God, you're intolerant. God, you're rude. God, I can have what I want. God says, go ahead. And he backs off. And then we wonder where God is. Wonder why the miracles aren't taking place. Wonder what's happening to us. Wonder why we're oppressed. My goodness. We need to greatly fear the Lord. We need to realize that he is a mighty God. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hand of a living God. And our God is a consuming fire. You can either be consumed by him or you can be refined by him. And as you fear the Lord, you've got to let God cleanse those things out of your life. You've got to let Him change your desires. You've got to let Him change the way you are. You may have been born a certain way. You may have a certain aptitude for things. You may go after things. There may be generational things in your past. But it's time to cut that stuff off. Get rid of the ungodliness in your life. Start fearing the Lord and doing things God's way. Raise up a standard in your life. The standard is the Word of God. First thing the Lord tells Gideon after he shows him the first sign. He says, Gideon, I want you to get rid of your father's idols. I want you to get rid of the Baal. I want you to cut down the Asherah pole. It was like a totem pole. These were two demonic gods. 
that they were worshiping. And his dad had him in his own backyard. God said, before I'm going to use you for the miraculous things to deliver Israel, you've got to get rid of this stuff. Remember I said, Midian is not the problem. Worshiping other gods is the problem. God can take care of Midian. God can handle that. But we have to take care of what's in our heart. So here Gideon gets a, a word from the Lord that he's to take care of this. Now take a look at it, Judges chapter 6, verse number 25, and verse number 26. Judges chapter 6, verse number 25, and verse number 26. It says, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. Notice it says it came to pass the same night. The same night. Night. Gideon didn't wait weeks, months, years to carry out the word of the Lord. He went the same night. Now we find out why did he go at night? Well, he was afraid it was going to happen. So he took 10 of his father's servants. He went down and he did what the Lord commanded him to do. Look at the next verse. Verse 26. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. In other words, you're going to completely consume the bull and you're going to completely consume the wood of that demonic wooden image. Completely get rid of it in your life. We find in the book of Acts many people that had turned to the Lord, they gathered their books, sorcery stuff, the, 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 the weight of it and the amount of gold that it could have cost was added up. It was just amazing and they brought all that stuff and they burned it. We've preached this in this church before. Get rid of the demonic things in your, in your life. Get rid of the ungodly things in your life. I've heard testimonies of people that said that they heard footsteps in their attic. And then when they got rid of the junk that was in their house, the footsteps went away. Don't tell me there's not supernatural stuff going on connected to these ungodly things. Sometimes we're so connected to these things. We're so connected to our music. Well, I just like listening to the beat. Yeah, you're a fool. Because as you're listening to the beat... Ungodly things are getting put in your head over and over and over and over and over again. And then we wonder why when we're hammering, we hit our thumb with a hammer, the wrong words come out. Well, what you put in will come out. See, but if you put it in and you say, in the name of Jesus, be healed, you're putting the right things in. See, we've got to get rid of one and we've got to set up the other in the proper arrangement. God says, when you take out the demonic stuff, you've got to put the healthy fear of the Lord. Do it my way. My will, my way. That's the first thing you're going to have to do to get to the greater things. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, if you want to just take a look up on the overheads. Take a look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says, therefore, having these promises, what promises? God just told in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, I will be their God, they will be my people, I will dwell among them. Therefore... Chapter 7, verse 1, having these promises of God's presence in our lives. Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Can I ask you a question? Did that say let us make God cleanse us? Did that say uh, let the pastor cleanse us? Let the church cleanse us? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I lost you guys. Let the church cleanse us? No. Who has the responsibility of cleansing? We do. We have to take care of these issues in our heart. God says, you know it, I want you to get a hold of it, and I want you to deal with it. Get rid of that stuff. Take care of it. Therefore, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, that word perfecting means that you are completing, that you are making it to a place, that you're not arrived, but you're on your way to arriving. You're on your way to heaven, and on your way to heaven, in that process, there's going to be things that you're going to have to get out of your life so that you can be complete in Him. And as long as you have something in that place, God can't be in that place. And so you've got to get that stuff out and set God up in the throne of your heart. Are you listening tonight? We're going to get to the greater works. Number one, we must greatly fear the Lord. Second thing, second thing, we're going to get to the greater works. We're going to have to greatly declare the word. Now, we hammer this in this church, and we beat this thing. Some people, I, I like what Pastor Jim just said the other day. He said, we don't beat it to death, we beat it to life. In other words, repetition helps us. 
And there are things that we need to be reminded of continually. I myself need to be reminded every day that I need to speak the word, that I need to stand and declare the promises of God, that I need to get a hold of the word of God for my situation. And any issue you have in your life, you can find a scripture that you can stand on and that you can start to declare the promise of God over your life and believe God for it. And as you do, God goes to work because God will not allow his word to return void. We would see it in the life of Gideon, Judges chapter 6, verse number 34, and verse number 35. Judges chapter number 6, verse number 34, and verse number 35 says, look at this. It says, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Literally, it means that the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. I love that picture. Think about God putting on a suit, right? And he puts on this suit, and his name is Gideon. See, in the same way in the New Testament, this was unusual in that time. But in our time now, as you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, as you receive the, the Lord, as you give your heart and life to Jesus, the Bible says that you have the Holy Spirit come and live on the inside of you. So every Christian is now robed in righteousness. We have God on us, but we are also in Him. We are now in Christ Jesus. We are now wearing Him, or could I say it like this? He's wearing us. So here we find the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet. He blew the trumpet. What does that mean? That means that there was a clear call. There was a sound that went forth. There was something that had meaning and purpose behind it. He blew the trumpet. And the Abizrites gathered behind him. Now, that's great. That's his clan. That's the people that were around him that could hear the trumpet call, but that wasn't enough. Take a look at what he does next, verse 35. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also gathered behind him. Hey, that's cool, but that wasn't enough. Take a look. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. What does that mean? He got the word out. He declared it. We are going to gather. We're going to fight. We're going to do great things. Come and gather to me. Come and meet me. You better get down here. You get down here or you get left out. Come on, come on, move. Let's go, let's go. And the Bible says that they gathered to him. What happened? He sent the word out and things took place and it happened and it came to pass. Why? Because he was robed with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was robed with him. Came upon him and he blew the trumpet and then he sent messengers out. He sent the word out. In our life, we've got to get the word out. Because if it just sits in the pages on your lap and you never speak it, you never do anything with it, you never get the word out, it can't do anything. It can't go forth and accomplish anything. you got to plant a seed in the ground before it can produce any fruit. And so in our lives, we can't just sit back and say, oh, I wish there were great things happening. I wish the miracles, where's all the miracles? No, you've got to do something. You've got to allow the Spirit of God to move through you and line up your tongue with His tongue and start to declare the Word of God and believe God and watch God move on your behalf. That's how you get to the greater things. Great verse in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Once again, I'll put it up on the overheads for you. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 13. Look at this. And since we have the same spirit of faith, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written... I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore speak. See, if you are a believer, then you are a speaker. Did you get a hold of that? If you are a believer, then you are a speaker. Why? Because you have the same spirit of faith. What you see in the Word is an example for you. So when you see the great men of old believing God and declaring the Word of God and declaring the will of God and the way of God, hey, you can do it too. You can be a great and mighty man or woman of God. You can be a warrior for the Lord in today's land. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to go fight the Midianites. But it does mean you're going to fight the devil. It does mean you're going to push back the darkness. It does mean that you're going to take authority and take ground in your neighborhood, in your family, in your home, in your business. It does mean in your future you don't have to be racked by the enemy. Doesn't mean you have to be pushed around by the world. No, you can stand and you can declare and you can believe God for great things in your life. Should have had a bigger amen than that, but that's okay. I'll take what I got. Praise the Lord. Last one for today. Last one for today. We will see greater things. We must. Number one, greatly fear the Lord. Number two, greatly declare the word. Number three, let God do the great work. Let God do the great work. See, first Gideon gathers up the people, right? 
He gets them all together. And then God says, hey, Gideon, this is cool. You got all these people gathered together. But uh, you know what? If you win a victory with all these people, Israel is going to boast and say that he did it by his own strength. Therefore, here's what I want you to do, Gideon. I want you to go down to the men. And I want you to tell them, if anybody's afraid, you can go home. Gideon says, okay, Lord. So he goes down to the men. He says, hey, men, if anybody's afraid, you can go home. 22,000 people stood up and walked off. And the guys that left, 10,000 of them. Now, again, you're talking to Gideon. This was the guy in the wine press. This was the guy I'm the least. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the least in my household. My, my clan is the weakest. This is the guy, show me a sign. And then show me a sign. And then don't be angry with me, Lord, but show me a sign. That's that guy. And now, God, you're going to take 22,000 men away? See, we, we don't think that that makes sense. And yet God says, remember, Midian's not your problem. Midian's my problem. I'll, I'll deal with them. I'll handle them. So Gideon says, okay, here we go. 10,000 men, let's do this. God says, mm-mm, still too many. Now, I could almost hear Gideon go and say, what? So God says, let's do a little test. Take them down to the water. Whoever gets down on his knees to drink, put them on one side. Anybody that pulls their hand to their mouth and laps the water, put them to the other side. Now, there was 300 on one side and the rest on the other side. Now, if it was me, I'd have been going, good. It's only 300 that God's going to remove. And yet God says, okay, dismiss the ones that got down on their knees. Get, get all those other thousands out of here. With these 300, I'm going to deliver Israel. Now, you've heard of the Spartans. Saw the movie 300. Terrible movie. None of us should be watching that trash. And the story goes that trained soldiers were so amazing and so wonderful that they defended Sparta, right? Remember that story? Sounds great, Leonidas and all that. Oh, his 300 men. Here's a greater story. Here's greater works. Why? Because Gideon, with 300 men that were oppressed, that weren't trained, that didn't have any weapons, that just a while ago were hiding in caves, and, and their leader was... 'ing wheat in the wine press, God takes these ones, says, "I'm going to deliver Israel by these 300." See, God's not looking for our great ability, our intelligence, our smartness, our cuteness, our niceness, our looks, our authority, our wealth, our power. Our... God's not looking for that. God says, "I will not share my glory with another, and all the earth will see my glory." Therefore, God takes earthen vessels, crusty, dirty vessels, and he pours his son Jesus in, and he makes something great out of it. Takes it, he gets glory. We don't get the glory. God gets glory. That's what this is about. Judges chapter 7, verse 7. The Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. I love it. I love it. Because God gets the glory. You read on and you find out that, uh, you know, I don't even know how they heard about Gideon, but there was a man having a dream about a piece of bread rolling into the camp, and it knocked over a tent, and the other guy said, this is none other than Gideon. None other than Gideon. My goodness, if I was a bread roll rolling into the camp, knocked over a tent, I'd say, that's not going to get the job done. And yet they were melting with fear. God routed them with a great, mighty, wondrous work. God did great things. God brought the princes and the kings down before Gideon and his men. God did greater works. F.F. F. Bosworth said this. He said, when we want what God wants, the way he wants it, then we will always have the Holy Spirit on our side. See, we've got to line up with God's way. God may have unusual direction. God may have stuff that we think, God, I, I can't do it that way. God, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough talent. And yet God says, believe me and do it my way, and I will take care of the rest. The problem is not your problem. The problem is my problem. My wife quoted this in the car on the way here. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. See, we've got to get it off of our hands. We've got to stop trying to take care of this stuff, and we've got to allow God... The Spirit of God on the inside of us to move and work together with the Holy Spirit. 
See, Gideon still had to go get the men. Gideon still had to go get the lights. Gideon still had to go get the torches and, and put them under the, 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 the pottery, right? And, and, and still had to lift up a shout and blow the trumpet and do his part. Gideon still had to go after him and gain the victory. He still had to do all that stuff, but it was God who routed the enemy before 300 men. That's a miracle, and that's a greater work. Therefore, if we're ever going to go out and pray for somebody's healing, you're not going to heal them. You can't do it. If you're ever going to believe God for supernatural provision, you're not going to provide. If you're ever going to believe God for deliverance, and speak in the name of Jesus, devil, go, you're not going to cast it out in your own power or strength or ability. Because we can read about demons in the Bible and said, hey, I don't know who you are. And then they beat the guy up. See, it's in the power and the authority of our almighty God living on the inside of us, Jesus who gave us his authority, who left us his spirit, the other helper, moving and living on the inside of us that the greater works will get done. Last verse for tonight, Acts chapter 4, verse number 33. Turn there with me. This is a great verse. You've got to see it in your Bible. Acts chapter 4. Back to the New Testament now. Acts chapter number 4, verse number 33. Persecutions are happening in the church. Things are taking place. Church gathers together. They report what's happened. They pray together. And the place where they were praying was shaken. Man, how cool is that? The Bible says that the believers were all together. And take a look at Acts chapter 4, verse number 33. This is where we live today. This is after the cross. This is with the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse 33, and says this. It says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Now I want you to notice the placement of two words, and they're the same word. I highlighted them there on the overhead for you. With great power, not just with power but with great power. See, we're after the greater works. We've got to get to the greater works. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord. How? And great grace was upon them all. Well, what is grace? Grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. We can say that together. Let's, let's all say that together and put my behalf when I can't do it in there, okay? Let's make it personal. Grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. See, if you're going to get to the greater works, you've got to allow the Spirit of God to work in and through you. Yeah, you're working. Yeah, you're using up all your energy and might and strength and everything that you've got, you pour it all in, but it's not going to make any difference unless God puts His great grace in. That'll get the job done on your behalf. What did we learn tonight? Well, we learned tonight that if we will see greater things, we must, number one, greatly fear the Lord. You've got to cleanse yourself. You've got to get rid of that junk in your life. Second thing, greatly declare the word, stand and believe God and declare the word of God out of your mouth. If you believe, therefore you speak. And finally, what did we learn tonight? We got, we got to let God do the work. If you got something from the word of the Lord tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak the word of God to you guys tonight. You guys were great. I really appreciate you guys staying put. Like I mentioned, we've got some greater things ahead of us. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart is right with God. None of what I said can happen in your life. None of it. Those greater works we were talking about, not going to happen unless you've given all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus. Jesus made this statement to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. He said, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, oftentimes we turn off when we hear that statement. We think of it as weirdo and, and craziness and all that kind of stuff because we've seen it in Hollywood or television or movies or read about it on the internet or in books or magazines, and we don't want to have anything to do with that kind of weirdo stuff. And yet this is not about what Hollywood, movies, television, books, magazines, or the internet says. This is about what the Bible says. And if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you want to go to heaven, deny your presence in hell, you must be born again. Now, that doesn't happen because you've lived a good life or because you've been a good person or because the good you've done outweighs the bad you've done. God is not just looking for good people. There are going to be a lot of good people that don't make it to heaven. Let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. If you think you're going to get to heaven and be born again, you're not going to make it just by being good. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Can't get there by your goodness. Can't be good enough because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. 
What does that mean? That means it's going to get thrown out. Can't get to heaven, be born again because you've attended church. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me you were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or Christian as a child? You were wearing religious jewelry, cross, you know, maybe the t-shirt that said Jesus, belt buckle that said in him, something like that. You're born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible say that you're born again, headed for heaven, because you're raised in church. Parents tell you you're a Christian. You wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized as a Christian as a child, because you're born in America, that that gets you into heaven. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere in your Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Come on. Come on. Why do you think you're going to get to go to heaven tonight? Maybe you think you're going to be born again, headed for heaven, because, you know, you've uh, got involved at your last church. You know, it wasn't just when you were a child. You sit in church right now in front of me. And your last church, maybe you got involved, sang in the choir, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of you as the leader. And therefore, you're going to get to go to heaven. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say church involvement gets you into heaven? It doesn't say you can help out enough or volunteer enough or sit in enough church that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. You know, you can sit in your garage and call yourself a car, but that doesn't make you a car. Same way you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. God's not looking for membership cards or volunteer hours before you can enter the gates of heaven. Come on, let's talk tonight. What makes you think you're going to get to go to heaven? Be born again. Sometimes people say, well, you know what, I, I get to go to heaven because I know who God is. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection, sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. And, and I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. I, I know scriptures from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? Well, if you'd read your Bible, you know the Bible says the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head. Knowing who God is, having some mental ascent towards him. And that gets you right with God headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. But rather, this is about your heart. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing like we talked about. I quoted that scripture when Jesus said in the book of Revelation, when I come, I want to find you hot or cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, lukewarm, what does that mean? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because think of it. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you're not born again, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you're not headed for heaven, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, when, uh, he said if you confess me before men... I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Let's get past that. Because remember the statement, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Jesus wasn't embarrassed of you when he went to the cross. Hung bloody, naked, beaten. And now he's asking you to make a statement, saying, yeah, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus in this safe and friendly church service. Listen, they're blowing up churches in other parts of the world. This is a safe and friendly place. It's a place where you can come in and lift your hands to the Lord and not have to wonder. Tonight, come on, you can make a statement for Jesus by simply raising your hand. I'm not trying to trick you, not trying to point you out or make fun of you. We're all excited for you. We want you to do this. No one's judging you. No one's criticizing or condemning you in this place. We're praying for you right now. We're believing, God, that you're going to give your heart and life to Jesus. We, we just let him come into your heart. Give him all your heart and all of your life tonight, acknowledging your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand. I'll see you go up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, better than spending eternity away from God. So tonight, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. 
Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Never said yes to Jesus, giving them all of your heart and life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? Well, if you're lukewarm in this place and you know that's the condition of your heart, when I described it, you can get right with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus by raising your hand. Wherever you're at, all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, wherever you're at all over the world, you can raise your hand. God is watching. You can tell us right afterwards or come into the church service. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go all together. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart? Need to give God all of your life? Got you, man. You can put your hand down. Who else? There's three and four up top. Got you guys over there. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart? Need to give God all of your life? Thank you, number five. God bless you. Who else? Who else? You're saying, man, I, I know I need to do this. Come on, go for it. Go for it. You can do this. Anybody else? I'm going to close this up. I'm going to close this up. Don't miss this opportunity. Just when I'm looking in your direction, pop your hand up. That's you. Come on, go for it. Go for it. Who else tonight? Sitting there wondering if you should. Yeah, yeah, you should. Go for it. Go for it. Anybody else? It's my last call, and then I'm going to close it up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for five wise people tonight. Hallelujah. All right, all five of you, if you're number six, seven, or eight, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout. As we do that, no one's going to leave. We're all going to wait. We're all going to let you come forward, okay? And I want you to get your stuff, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. Come on, let's stand and welcome them as they come. Even if you didn't raise your hand, get down here. Come on if you need to. Come on down. Amazing love, how can it be? They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. My king will die for me. Amazing love. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. It's true. Come on down. It's my joy you honor you. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. I honor you in all. Hallelujah. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. Anybody else, just come on, slip out on the aisle and meet us up front. All right, hey guys. So glad you guys came to give your heart and life to Jesus. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You can put a smile on your face, okay? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really, really good guy. Nothing weird goes on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already got past me and my stories about Gideon. That's about as weird as it's going to get tonight, okay? He's cool. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance so you're not wondering or not afraid, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to sit down and read about what you just did and what to do next in your walk with God. You need to find out what to do next, okay? That information that he gives you, it's easy reading, it's free. Invest a little bit of time, find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing, third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you a friend we have here in the church called a spiritual personal trainer. He said, Pastor, I thought you said you weren't weird. You're giving away friends? Yeah, that's what we do here at The Rock. We give away friends. We call them spiritual personal trainers, okay? Basically, it's a person in church. It's going to help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. They'll come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible. One a week, that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back to your old way, but that you go on with the new way, with God's ways. Greater things are ahead of you, okay? Now listen, give us a year sitting under the teaching here at The Rock Church, World Outreach Center consistently put your time your effort in listen to the word of god and for the rest of your years you'll be so blessed you'll just say man i didn't know it could be this good am i telling the truth everyone okay now i'm going to add a fourth thing for tonight pastor joel i'm going to add a fourth thing for you guys tonight okay pastor joel if you want it's going to lead you in a prayer for the baptism of the holy spirit you can have that tonight that power is available to you the bible says jesus said he would send another helper and he said wait in jerusalem till i send the promise of the father the holy spirit and therefore the believers that gave their heart and life to jesus they were endued with power it's a baptism what does that mean submersion you're just going to be submerged in the power of god the love of god 
and you're going to have the word of God open to you. You're going to be a witness, okay? He'll describe that for a minute. He'll lead you in a prayer for that, and then I'll let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.